Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of The Search. So uh, for today's episode, uh, I'm going to try and be a little bit less noisy and a lot more brief than the last one. I apologize if it was a little bit long, but it's uh, it's just that it's one of those things that I know will have a major impact later on. And so I figured we, we should talk about it more extensively than maybe I'm qualified to. As a disclaimer... I know the very, very basics of the first aid situation in the um, mental health field, and I don't know how to spell community, so I'm going to fix that right now, and you all are going to pretend that this didn't happen, all right? And maybe I shouldn't be using slides anyway, because then you guys can listen to this in the car, and I can be more expressive. So... Today I'm going to talk about how to support your community as a healthcare professional with the remotest understanding of of any mental health condition. And I'm the person with the least understanding of it probably talking to you right now. Let's be honest, surgeons by trade aren't good at mental health. Um, We limit our exposure to it because of the nature of our training. And that's not to say that it's good or it's bad, but it is the way that things go. You can't blame an omelette for not tasting too sweet. What can I say? So uh, just like with the previous one, there are various sources, uh, mainly the Psychosocial Center at the International Federation, Red Cross Red Federation, because they've written a very extensive but very simple guide, and I've taken some parts of it to give like a first aid type of discussion. So um, we've all heard the working from home talk, you know, about waking up at regular times, changing even if you have nothing to do, uh, doing two two to three hours of work and then taking a break. No late nights, early mornings. Um, In the interest of full disclosure, I am filming this at 4 a.m. because uh, that's the only free time that I've had. Um, Make time to socialize online and do routine grounding tasks. So do things that you like doing around the house that you know make you feel okay. So things like regular chores that you're used to doing. Keep your life as regular as it can be given the circumstances. And connect with the people that you usually connect with, say at the gym or at the bar or whatever, coffee shop, etc. Now, my issue with that is that isolation has its own problems. And um, I don't think that it's avoidable. I think that isolation is the right thing to do. Social isolation is the right thing to do given our circumstances and the amount of information and the uh, quality of the treatment that we can provide at this moment in time for this particular condition that is COVID-19. Uh, based uh, respiratory uh, illness and I think that um, you know g- given our limitations social isolation is the right thing to do but it, it does come with with a price and that price is is your mental health to an extent many of us will be fine but some of us will need some help along the way and the reason why is probably more complicated than I can comprehend given my my limited amount of knowledge in the field um, but part of it is an anxiety buildup. And I don't mean the colloquial term anxiety. I mean the uh, the clinical term anxiety. So we all have an innate amount of anxiety that will lead to a, a, a healthy outcome once it's understood at a, a higher cognitive level. The problem is that from very limited studies done in Italy and China and certain other places and studies to do with other types of isolation uh, with people with different backgrounds than us necessarily. So I'm talking about prisoners in in isolated confinement, right? We know that that the type of anxiety that we we have leads to, uh, may lead to a, a, a different path especially if you're living in cramped quarters, especially if you're of uh, lower socioeconomic status, especially if you've had a previous uh, history of a uh, criminal uh, record, etc. Those things, when combined with anxiety, don't uh, lead to um, extremely optimized outcomes. Let's leave it at that. A lot of the anxiety-related issues come from concerns. So a concern is uh, something, uh, a thought or an idea that leads to anxiety. So one of these concerns uh, is probably the stigma that people who have had coronavirus 
seem to have in society, in particular societies, in particular cultures. So certainly there are some cultures where corona-positive patients have not been treated very well. They've been treated as if they're the cause of the problem. Uh, we've heard certain uh, people in the media who uh, have uh, an extremely um, dedicated following, uh, making uh, comments attributing uh, the development of this virus to a specific um, group. And I don't think that that's fair. I think that it's part and parcel of the condition living in planet Earth that these things can happen and are a calculated risk. And I think that there's a fair amount of literature that shows that pandemics have happened before. Not within our lifetime, but they have happened before. Um except for Ebola, maybe, but nothing this bad. Um, so uh, I think that the first thing to outline is that we have health concerns. So we have thoughts about our health. And those thoughts are related to how we come in contact with people around us and are also related to the stigma of people who are corona positive that we know. And believe you me, you are going to know at least one or two people that are corona positive. So in Kuwait, trauma is the biggest killer, period. And I always tell people that you know at least one person who has died in a car accident, if you look at your phone. And chances are that's true. It's about, it's as bad as 10% in one of the recent years, uh, without going into details. I might do a talk just on those statistics at one point, but not today. So that stigma of, of coronavirus and being corona positive is, is, is something that I'm seeing here and there these days, uh, both online and otherwise. And what concerns me is that you're going to know people who are corona positive, and it's extremely likely, no, not extremely, uh, quite likely, that you might end up being labeled as being corona positive, uh, or COVID-19 positive, or novel coronavirus positive, depending on which phrase you decide to use. So those healthcare concerns and, and the unhealthy thoughts that, that are linked to the anxiety may not be very productive, and you should keep an eye out for them. Another thing that you, you'll tend to see is anxiety over whether or not you can take care of your family, your codependents, and whether the people around you can rely on you. Um, certainly, there's financial anxiety. Uh, we're experiencing it ourselves as healthcare professionals who uh, probably have different disciplines that are currently inactive. Um, and then there's the boredom and the loneliness. So being quarantined, with a lack of your normal social construct has immense consequences on the way that you'll interact with people afterwards. So there are a lot of reports out there of people developing a sort of um, inability to socialize as they would normally or inability to stick to a certain routine after isolation, especially in Italy and in China. And then there's anger over the contagion risk. So anger towards certain people because of the contagion risk. And above and beyond all of this, right up there in the top, I want to say a right-hand corner, is that your mental health. If you have a previous history of PTSD or depression spectrum disease or other diseases of that nature or labels of that nature, conditions of that nature, depending on which, which of them you talk about and which side of the Atlantic you're on and what beliefs you ascribe to, you may you may uh, end up being more susceptible. It's not very clear. There is no clean-cut data on this, unfortunately, because I think that mental health is one of those things that we definitely could have done a better job of addressing with COVID-19. Then there's the survivors themselves who have their own set of stressors, in addition to the anxiety that we talked about. And these are the stigma that's attached to it. So survivors, I've noticed, tend to feel very stigmatized, Right. They tend to feel that they are to blame for, for spreading it to other people within society. Um, they have reactions to social isolation, especially in places where not everybody is practicing social isolation. They make them feel like they're ostracized or being punished for getting it, right? And the reactions of the communities likewise do that too. There's oftentimes an attached survivor's guilt especially if they've seen a lot of things happening. So one of the unfortunate things is that in many places, we've had to treat uh, patients in the emergency room through the continuity of their care. 
and they've seen escalation of care for other patients, and they've seen poor outcomes in other patients. Now, as a physician, going back to when you're a medical student or as a nurse, when you were a, a nursing student or as an RT, when you were a respiratory therapist, I think that, that we can all agree that the first time that we've seen a poor outcome, it still sticks with us to this day. If you're listening to this and you've seen a poor outcome, you probably still remember it, right? And last but certainly not least, there's always that fear of a recurrence, which we know is a risk, right? We don't know this virus well enough to be able to say that it's 100% not going to happen. So it is a risk. Now, for you to support yourself through these anxiety, anxious moments or, or through your isolation period, the first thing that you need to do is you need to sort of empower yourself. Provide yourself with self-support. The only way to empower yourself in any given situation is to understand it first. Now, we tend to rely a lot on, I'm not sure what's happening with my spelling today. We tend to rely a lot on 24-7 uh, droning news, stuff that's a slow drip on Twitter or, on Sky News or whatever else. I'm not going to say Fox, but, you know, places like that, right? These 24-hour news channels and the slow drip of information. That information gives you stuff to think about, but it doesn't give you stuff to understand necessarily. And if you, if you need to understand it further, you should probably ask somebody who you trust and who knows you well enough to know how to convey the message to you in a way that, that, that empowers you. And then advocate and discuss and debate it with your friends. Because the more you have this discussion with your social networks, not directly online, you know, not on social media, but through your own literal social network, the people who you have on WhatsApp, the people who you've been text messaging while you're in quarantine, the people who you Zoom meet with, right? The more time that you spend with that, the more time you're spending on advocacy. The more time you're spending on advocacy, the more you're negating some of those concerns. When they see that you're empowered and you're discussing it openly and you're explaining that the infection risk may or may not be there because of X, Y, and Z, and that the condition seems to be relatively okay overall and all these things, you're acclimatizing them to it, right? You're advocating for, for your concerns and you're showing them that this is something that we're all going through. It's tough for all of us, but you know what? We're all tough too, and we're going to get through it. Okay? Then make sure that you educate yourself. So stay up to date. The situation is changing. The information that we have is changing. We need to stay up to date. And quantify the risk. Quantify it for yourself and for others. You knowing what your risks are, whether you've been exposed or not, huge difference, man. Like, it makes you definitely understand the science, right? It makes, you, it makes it much easier for you to, to work things out. And remember to thrive and not just survive. So if you're socially isolated for whatever reason and you're worried about your job, call your boss and ask them and be honest about it and tell them the truth. Tell them what your future aspirations are. And if you're getting bad news over the phone, what your concerns are, obviously, if you're getting bad news over the phone, then now you know that you need to work on your plan B and now's the time to do it. Invest in online courses. Invest in making the right phone calls. Invest in establishing a line of credit. Plan for what's coming up next if you're worried about it. Don't just sit there. Plan for it. Be prepared, right? And that, that's the advice that I genuinely try and give patients who've been through it. And I make it clear to them that they're not the only one. And as healthcare workers, we're probably going to be next on there, right? We, we, there is a risk, and it's significantly higher than the general population for healthcare workers. Now, for healthcare workers who are going through this type of thing, there's a little bit more to it. And, you know, as a healthcare worker, when, when you're volunteering to help out, and you're like me, so psychology and psychiatry aren't your strong suit. Mental health wasn't that A grade that you got, okay? Um, this is very uncomfortable. And I know this because uh, when I first started off in trauma, this wasn't something that was very well emphasized to me. And, I found it genuinely uncomfortable. Breaking bad news in the ICU was genuinely uncomfortable. I found it hard. Read about it. And I think that a good place to start is the uh, Remote Psychosocial uh, First Aid booklet that was recently updated by the Red Cross Red Crescent uh, International Federation. So I think that this is a very good place to start because it sets it up in a way that it's actually a conversation 
and you have an approach at least. So they go with the look, listen, link approach, which is standardized pretty much. So look at the current situation that your patient is in if they have particular concerns or if you do. Try and find people actually looking for support. Uh, look at what their risks are, how their needs are affected, and expect them to be emotional at the time. Listen and let them begin the conversation. Introduce them uh, to people who are helping you. And I think the volunteers can do this too. Uh, pay attention, listen actively, accept their feelings first. Accept their, dis dis their distress. Find out what the underlying concern is. And then learn how to calm it in an educated manner that addresses that concern. And then link it to information that you know is practical. And connect them to loved ones that they trust and that will empower them. And assess services that can help them around their community. There are certain phrases that you can use to open things up. So you can use them in any language, but they have to have a cultural bearing. So there are certain cultures where, where you, you shouldn't be saying things. So uh, I'm not going to give any examples, but there are certain cultures. Let's leave it at that. So um, where, where some of these phrases may be misunderstood is what I'm trying to say. So one of the things that you can say is that you, you genuinely understand where they're coming from and you understand why they're, they're sad or why they're un angry. And tell them that it's normal to be sad and angry because you know what? It is normal to be sad and angry after everything that they've been through. And tell them that, that you're not here to, 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 to calm them down. You are here to provide them with possible solutions. You are here to empower them so that they can begin their journey towards recovery. You know, the more you listen, the more you understand. The more you understand, the more you can normalize things for them. The more you normalize things for them, the more you'll recognize what the internal capacity is to cope, how much you can tell your patient. The more time you spend with that and the more information that you give them, the easier it is for them to understand and to be empowered. The more individual options that you give them that are individualized towards their own concerns, the better that they feel and the more empowered they are. And the more social services that you set up with them, the better it is for them overall. Whatever you do, do not pressure them if they don't want to talk to you. Do not ask them why. Do not be judgmental. Do not use technical terminology. And don't talk about yourself or your personal issues. Don't make it into a two-way conversation necessarily. This is about them. This is their time to be empowered. Your time comes with the coping talk that we did earlier for about 45 minutes, where I bored you to death. Don't give false promises or reassurances that you can't back up. You're a medical professional, and you need to recognize that. You can share other people's stories and experiences. And don't ever break patient confidentiality with these situations. Like, I would be offended if somebody in my unit uh, broke patient confidentiality with somebody in the media about mental health concerns for a patient. I, I would genuinely be offended. It would be like you're offending me personally. With that in mind, recognize that this is something that we're all going through collectively as a community around the world. When I say community, I mean medical professionals. Uh, I mean uh, Kuwaitis who are abroad. I mean Kuwaitis who are here. I mean the world worldwide. I mean my colleagues in Montreal, my colleagues in New York, all over the place. People who I practically grew up with. I know what you're going through. We're going through it here as well. Uh, everybody's doing their part. I'm hoping to do my part with these talks and other things that I'm working on. And feel free to subscribe. Uh, thank you for all the emails after the previous episode. I received a lot of feedback. A lot of it was very, very good. Um, and uh, please subscribe. And please keep the reviews and the feedback coming. And stay strong. And, you know, eventually we're going to have some live sessions, I think. I'm just not sure how to do it or when to do it. Like, I'm recording this at 4 a.m. local time here in Kuwait, which is perfect for stateside, but doesn't really work out for people in the Middle East. So I'm not sure how I'm going to do that. But uh, thank you all for listening.